Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to be a part of today's webinar. I want to express my gratitude to uh, everybody at Growth Strategy Partners, the Munitions Law Group, and the Hickory Group for being our panelists today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kenyon Gleason, president of the NASGW, and uh, this has been a long going thing for us, a partnership with Growth Strategy Partners um, to do these webinars. We've done a variety of topics this year, and I know uh, Chris and his team have a lot more on tap uh, for the rest of this year and into next year already. They've, uh, we've got a list of ideas, and, and we did some surveys, and we're always interested in your feedback. If there are topics or things that you'd like us to cover, uh, please shoot us a note or, or drop a note in the chat box and, and uh, let us know if you have any great ideas. Um, we did a survey last year. We're still working out on getting some of those things covered, but this one today in particular is, I think, super meaningful and super timely, and so I was really excited that Chris put this one together. I'm very excited to hear the conversation about uh, this topic. I think it's really relevant given the market and, and kind of what things are out there, but it's also something that I think people forget to do. You get so busy in your day-to-day -day trying to do your business and run everything, and, and uh, you kind of forget to, to sort of plan out where you're going to go <laughs> when you're done. And so I think it's a really great topic. I appreciate everybody uh, taking time to, to join us today. I want to just put in a quick little plug for the NASGW annual meeting. Uh, our expo is coming up here in San Antonio in just a couple of weeks from now. In fact, I'll be getting on a plane about nine days from now and heading to San Antonio for a week. We've got a great show plan. So for those of you on the line that are going to be there, I look forward to seeing you there. Please, please grab me and say hello. But uh, we've got almost 300 exhibitors and a whole bunch of wholesale buyers ready to to see the the latest and greatest, and and it uh, should be a fun time the 17th through the 20th in San Antonio. So uh, if you haven't got your tickets yet and you're planning to go, uh, hurry and uh and uh good luck with the hotels those are <laughs> those are all sold out but uh or many of them are so anyway um thanks so much again for being on thanks chris and and, and team for putting this together i look forward to hearing the conversation and uh and uh let us know if, if you got some great ideas for us i'll turn it over to you chris thanks Thanks, Kenyon, uh, very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Chris DeCenso here. Uh, Kenyon, thanks. Thanks to NESUW, a partnership we've had putting on these uh, educational programs. Uh, basically, it started at, at SHOT, uh, SHOT Show. Uh, a lot of the owners we'd spoken with there were asking about selling the business, wanting selling the business. We've seen a lot of that uh, in the first half of this year. So the thought was, let's let's get a good team together to talk about how do you how do you how do you plan to exit your business and or how do you grow it depending on what your goals are. So uh, today we've got uh, Clay Cheshire from the Munitions Law Group and Nick Kirk from the Hickory Group. You guys there? Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. This is Nick Kirk from Hickory. Great to uh, have the opportunity to present to everyone today, and many thanks to Chris and Clay for their participation and NASQW for sponsoring the event. So we're going to um, um, just log logistics. We are recording it. It'll be posted a little later, maybe tomorrow, and you will get a copy of the presentation uh, when we're done. So today, uh, topic agenda is going to be this. Uh, let's talk about quickly what the goals are uh, of what we're trying to accomplish today, what the themes that we want to share with you. Uh, we'll go through some introductions a little about who we are. Uh, we'll talk about exit planning. We'll get into more of the depth of the sales process. How do you do this? What are the challenges you may run into? And then what are the next steps that you should be uh, doing as an owner of the business? I think we have 90% uh, of the attendees today are president and CEO, so it's a real good turnout. Uh, so uh, goals and themes, what are we trying to do? You know, Really to, trying to provide you with some insights on how to prepare your business for a future a transaction or sale. This is all about you. How do you, how do you get you get better? Um, when we talk a lot with other professional service providers, a lot of the challenges that they, quote unquote, complain about is the fact that their clients aren't ready. So hopefully this is gonna give you some insights on, on how to get ready. A Couple of the themes that you're gonna hear throughout the day, or I guess the hour, uh, you should always be trying to maximize the value of your company in preparing it to sale. 
Uh, and you'll hear, if you don't know, that it may happen sooner than you think. It may be longer than you think. Therefore, you're always going to be maximizing that value. There's a sales process involved. Doesn't, it's not an event. Um, I'll tell you a story about a client that's, that's had a couple tries at this. Um, they've been keeping focus, and actually the value keeps increasing, but it's a process that's going to make it successful. And when you sell, it may, need, may not be on your time may not be on your timetable. This kind of goes back to number one about always being prepared to sell because it may happen sooner than you want. Uh, we'll talk a little about that today. So let's talk first about uh, who's here. I am the good looking one on the top left hand corner, Chris Desenzo with Growth Strategy Partners. Um, most of what Growth Strategy Partners does is focus on increasing the profitability and revenue uh, and performance of a business. Uh, and that's again kind of the value we're bringing here today is to show how do you how do you increase that value. Um, we've been very successful at actually increasing the value of our client clients over five times in a couple years, uh, based on our research, seven keys to growth, and how we approach our clients. Uh, thought making the team our team today successful would be bringing in an attorney. Uh, Clay and a banker, financial advisor, Nick Kirk. So, Clay, why don't you give us a little background on you? Hey, everybody. This is Clay. I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm calling you from Atlanta, calling in from Atlanta. So if I sound Southern, it's because I am. Um, I have been practicing law personally for 17 years now. And in 2005 was when I began doing some work uh, for the firearms industry. And... Uh, our firm, Munitions Law Group, we are a a full service law firm to the firearms and outdoor sporting goods industries. And, and what full service means is, and this is basically what we do, we do corporate transactional, which includes mergers and acquisitions, regulatory work. Uh, a lot of these industry members are regulated not just by ATF, but also by the Tax and Trade Bureau, by the State Department, et cetera. We do patent work because a lot of the, the, our clients have technologies that need to be protected. We do litigation work because a lot of our clients um, get sued or need to sue or even prepare for that. And, uh, and then we also have a staff of, of experts who uh, are not attorneys. They, uh, they tend to be uh, either retired regulators or industry executives. Um, but basically what we do, we do and, it, and it's a blast and a privilege. We do firearms law for firearms clients all day, every day. And you like it too, right? It's great. It's a blast. Yeah, it's a blast. That's the what's the uh, the well, whatever. Nick, give us <laughs> give us a little background. Yes, sir. Uh, folks, uh, the Hickory Group, uh, contrary to popular belief, is not a Southern North Carolina-based firm but we are a New York-based New York firm. And our heritage at Hickory uh, is from Lazard, our chairman, Mark Francis. He's a former Lazard London and New York partner and myself. I began my career at Lazard. So we bring the same sophisticated M&A advice that we provide to clients at Lazard to the growth end of the middle market. And more specifically, with the firearm sector, is a personal passion of mine. Uh, my father was a Vietnam vet, was a CB in Nam, and uh, I just grew up shooting in firearms, clay, uh, clay shooting, deer hunting, etc. And moving to New York, uh, folks here on the East Coast certainly don't have an appreciation for the heritage of firearms in our country. And a few years ago, uh, noticed that the industry certainly lacked a firm that provided specific, tailored financial expertise to firearm folks, whether it was ammunition manufacturers, whether it was um, long barrel handgun manufacturers, whether it was accessory providers, holsters, et cetera, um, the industry was lack, lacking a banker. And so after performing extensive research, some of which you can find on our website, hickorygp.com, H-I-C-K-O-R-Y-G-P.com, um, we've developed a nice practice. We recently closed a mezzanine financing for Grunt Style. Grunt Style is the premier patriotic apparel firm. Um, a, a has a number of firearm groups that it provides uh, tailored shirts and hoodies to. And we have a, a few other uh, clients in process in the market, um, expecting to announce those transactions at shot. And so 
you know, we'd want folks to know about us, that we provide tailored financial M&A advice, and whether it's seeking to sell your firm or seeking to raise equity or debt, uh, we'd love to have a conversation and share how we can be of help. Thanks, Nick. Uh, so this is the team you're going to listen to today. If you have questions along the way, um, uh, there's a questions box in that little window on the right. You'll be able to type them in there, and we'll try to get to them throughout the presentation. If not, we'll definitely address them uh, at the end. If you need to minimize that window, there's an arrow in the top left-hand corner. You press that, that'll minimize it. So let's start talking about the first question, or you know, should I sell it or should I grow it? Um, when we look at that question, there's three main p um, components that, that come into play. Uh, for, you know, one is, you know, what do you need to retire? Okay, assuming there's going to be a retirement on this. Again, I think the number is 80% or so of any any owner's assets are tied up in their business. Um, what do you need to retire? What's your business worth? Which is kind of that financial question. And if those two match, or the value is higher than what you want to retire then good you could you can then sell sell but the question is are you personally ready to do that um many owners actually been talking to family members talking about their dad that's been working in the business for 30 something years and that business is his identity that's who he is and for him not to be in the, involved in that business is going to be you know shock therapy so he's personally not ready the business has great value you plenty of people wants to sell and retire, but he's personally not ready to sell that business. So, you know, first thing you need to think through is, A, do you have the business value? Do you, does that match your retirement needs? Do you know that? And then personally, are you ready to, uh, to, to sell this in transition, whether you retire or just sell and, and move on to other things? So answering this question, you know, if these, these, these three match, then yes, you're ready to sell. If not, you should be growing the business. You should be working on improving the profitability, the growth, performance, et cetera, of that business. So that's going to be the first um, question you should be asking yourself is where am I? Am I trying to sell it or am I trying to grow it? So on that, I've got a poll question for everybody because curious. the question I have curious-wise is uh, an interactive session here. Um, Want to know when are you planning to exit your business? Uh, you should see a screen in front of you with a poll, and if you would click on the answer, only one, you're trying to sell like immediately, like yesterday, uh, maybe you're a year to two years out, three to five, six to 10, I have no plan to sell it at all. Um, good, great people are voting, this is awesome right now. And so the question is, how far out are people looking? Uh, and I'm gonna give you a little live feedback. Most of them are a little farther out, which is great, because if any people that are selling now, uh, unless they're in the middle of the process and they got all planned, that might be a little more challenging. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close this and I'm going to share it with you. And uh, so hang on, close and share. You should now be seeing the answers to uh, what the timing is. And I'm going to ask Nick. Nick, what's your what's your reaction to what you're seeing? Can you see it there, Nick? No, I, Chris. Yep, I'm here. I'm just uh, absorbing some of the uh, the distribution of the responses. I think three to five years is a very appropriate timeline. I think that as I've you know talked with you and Clay, you know, folks make a decision to sell or go to capital markets, you know, once every couple of years. So this is a very uh, appropriate distribution of of folks. That's where that's where most are, are right. Here. You yeah, get some seven yeah. percent that are now 7% in the mm -hmm. next year or two, but majority are three to five years out and some really have no mm -hmm. plans at all. So that's, that's pretty good. Uh, Clay, anything and you want to add on say, that? Oh. And yeah, I mean, and it, Chris, it, it, go ahead, Nick. And, and Chris, I would say that this is now is the time for all those folks in three to five years to really start thinking about working with you or working with Clay to get their business uh, sorted properly. Because it, it, it ensures a smoother sale process and ensures a much better sale price to work with a, a good lawyer like a munitions group or a good consultant firm like Growth Strategy Partners. That's why they're listening today, right? Because they're smart. Exactly. Clay, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to say, I mean, what we're looking at is 85% are, you know, three years or never. 
And uh, we know you, know, you should never, never say never, right? But, um, but, but what I see from this is that, that most of the attendees, they've got time. And time is, you know, this is a process. We'll talk more about that today. But uh, it takes a long time to get the house in order and to execute on a sale. So having time is good. When you have time, that's when you don't make mistakes. That's when you're ready. That's when you maximize your value. So this is encouraging. And it's good, actually, because it fits well with what we've outlined today in terms of timing. We're not looking to tell people necessarily how to do it tomorrow. Well, you can't. So, all right. So let's go through um, and look at – so we're going to spend a very small piece on, on value creation um, and a lot more on the sales process, but it's all connected. So let's talk first about um, if you're going to increase the value of business – What's driving uh, we call it positive business value? And, and there's a list here. Now, keeping in mind, there's, um, I'll say, tiers of importance. Uh, and one of the top tiers of importance that a buyer is going to look at, you know, again, let me, let me even step back a little, right? What drives the value of business? Well, it's what the buyer sees in it, right? It's all about the buyer. It's not about you, what math you may do. That's a starting point, but it's about what the buyer sees and sees a value. And, and so if you want to increase the value of business, first thing you do want to start is on the financial side, uh, EBITDA, uh, growth, profits, less the non-cash expenses is primary driver of value of a business. Uh, the more profitable it is, the more, the more valuable it is. Revenue growth might be, might be behind that and, and a strong leadership team. I remember uh, I've talked to a bunch on the venture capital and private equity side and one of the comments they made stuck with me a while ago, um, and they were talking actually about the team in particular. And they and they said, you know, if you look at the A and B teams and A and B products or you know or customers, these guys were saying, I will take the A team and the B product versus the A product and the B team, because that 100%. team is what's going to make that business right su successful. Yep, 100. percent And and Chris and Clay, just for your knowledge and for the knowledge of our listeners, folks don't have to think about a 100% sale now. If there was a state planning or a desire to achieve some liquidity, because a number of the folks in the firearm sector, this is their asset, and perhaps they want to get a liquidity, uh, establish a trust fund or two, pay for education. Private equity funds, as you rightly pointed out, Chris, do look for opportunities to buy into a business over time. So that's what, what folks should think about as they follow up with you or, or, or Clay or myself post-webinar is, is there an opportunity for something less than 100% sale? And the answer is yes. Good point. Very, very good point. We didn't actually dig into, I mean, you know, you could do, you could do an hour just on, you know, how do you drive business value? Uh, so we're trying to hit across a bunch of points. Um, but what you'll see here, you know, is a list, a, a, a short list of what uh, drives this value. The things that, don't drive value is when the buyers or when you don't have consistency and you can't explain it. And so, you know, you think about someone coming in, if you were to go buy your business and some of the reports don't match or you can't get the information that was, that was needed, um, you lose faith or you have less trust in what you're seeing. And that has a huge impact on what someone's going to pay. So, this is all about almost house cleaning. I mean, there's a, there's a value creation component to this. There's actually a, uh, a methodology that we used to, to drive business value. It's been very, very successful, but it takes years to make this work and to work well because there's actually so much going on. Um, so I'll leave here with this list unless Clay or, or Nick want to add to it because we're going to jump really into the sales process uh, and, and then what how do you make that successful? Anything, Clay or Nick, you want to add to this? Nothing from me. I guess that's a no. So, um, and again, if you have more questions on the value creation side, we can we can deal with those um, later. So let's talk about selling. So let's say we, we're going to go back to that chart that shows, you know, should you sell or should you grow? That was the real quick, that was the abbreviated version of how to grow it. Uh, now let's talk about the, the sales process and how do you sell it? Uh, I'm going to start by talking about the timeline and the team. So if you decide to make that decision uh, that you're going to that you're going to sell it, 
what you'll see here on the left side is that, you know, two to 20 years, whatever it might be, of creating the value. Uh, and then if you're going to sell it, you're going to be looking at nine to 18 months or so from the time to say go to actually closing the transaction, receiving the money. And, and we're going to go into that in more detail today. But the important thing that in order to make this work, you got to put your team together. Kind of as, as we've got the team today with myself, Clay, and Nick, you know, you need a team to make that transaction successful. On the left side, the value creation, you see you, you should have an accountant now, probably a corporate attorney. You may or may not have a wealth advisor or someone to deal with the money. But when you start talking about an exit, you need to bring in uh, another team or an additional team. Your accountant will probably be involved. Your corporate attorney will probably be involved. The wealth advisor definitely should be involved because that's going to go back to do you have the, the – what's, what's your financial plan uh, for retirement? Do you have enough money from the sale of the business and other assets to retire on? So the wealth advisor, again, if, if not there now, needs to be brought in. Uh, you'll see this growth advisor, exit planning advisor. That's the role Growth Strategy Partners plays, uh, A, in helping you either grow it and grow it and or preparing for the exit, um, looking out a few years. But then when you get into the exit, now you're going to pull uh, literally a transaction team together. And so on the attorney side, you see here, there's an attorney specific to deal with transactions, specific to deal with estates and regulatories. And then you got the M&A advisor. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'll ask uh, Clay first, talk a little about the, the attorneys, if you would, that might be involved in the team. Uh, and then we'll get Nick to talk about the role of the advisor. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Good. So, um, because I said no to your last question, and I don't know if you heard me. So, anyway, um, I, thanks for the opportunity to, to weigh in on this. Because uh, the point that I want to make is, you know, a lot of times when you look at you look at the the teams on the on the left column and the right column, you know, most most clients that that contact us um, already have an accountant they've worked with for years. They already have a general corporate attorney who they've worked with for years. They've obviously already got a wealth advisor in place. It's it's when you start really looking at this kind of an exit where you start going, okay, I need I need to find someone who's got a deeper knowledge of the industry that I'm in. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons that we, you know, anytime we have a client who needs to increase revenue, we put them in touch with Growth Strategy Partners because Chris understands the industry. He understands what drives revenue in the industry. He understands – he has relationships. So he's able to connect clients with other people who can help increase their business. Same thing with the, with the regulatory side of this. Um, you know, any – most just general M&A attorneys can, can, can handle the transaction documents. But where someone like Munitions Law Group helps uh, having a regulatory lawyer is to, is to help that M&A attorney understand the unique issues that need to be addressed because of the regulated nature of this business. Issues regarding federal firearms licenses, issues regarding compliance, those kinds of things. And really, it's the same thing with the M&A advisor. You know, it, because Hickory Group is going to have had connections with investors or banks that are interested in investing in this industry. So, you know, you really sort of, it helps to have someone on your team who has a specialized knowledge in your industry. That's the only observation I've got on this. The observation that I would have, uh, Chris, is that you need an advisor for this industry who understands the players on the capital side, both private equity firms and strategics, who are comfortable in this industry. As I say to folks many times, um, we had a group that wanted a junior capital slash growth investment. Um, and we learned the hard way going out to over 50 private equity invest folks and a handful would invest in this industry. Very active folks who, who, who have a very strong affinity for firearms and understand the risks but you have to sort out the advisor on the financial side that you want who has the contacts on the capital market side 
to to get you the right sale price and get you in front of the right buyers. This industry, more than any industry in America, is highly regulated. The uh, private equity firms, because of the social implications of investing in firearms, many are very wary. So you have to have the right contacts. And the Hickory Group has invested the time and the intellectual capital to develop relationships with private equity firms and the strategics, the VISTAs, Compass Diversified, the AOBCs, et cetera, to get our clients in front of the right folks. So you'll see over time, not only with Quant Style, we're we able to find them the right capital partner. But as I mentioned before, um, at SHOT, we'll be announcing a, a really nice um, uh, uh, transaction. So you have to have the right people in this space more than any other because of all the implications of investing in the firearm sector. Very different. We're very different. Everyone says that, mm -hmm. but this, is, this industry actually is so. All right, so this is the team, okay? So, you know, first thing you got to do is put your team together, um, and then let's start now the process. So, uh, Nick, let's go through uh, the, the steps you've, you've outlined here, and then we also just got to pick up the pace a little bit time-wise because we've got a bunch of slides to go through. Sure. So the, the process in terms of what we do on Hickory side in terms of, of selling the business, and I'll just be quick about this six-step process. First of all, we have to analyze your business. We have to understand whether you're an accessory business, rifle business, et cetera. Look at your underlying margins, your growth rates, and that'll help us lead into valuing your business. And given the, the state of play uh, in the industry, you know, folks can look at if it's a smaller business with smaller margins, anywhere from five times to six times trailing EBITDA, basically trailing cash flow into valuation. On the high end, if you're a premium accessory group, um, you can look at anywhere from eight times to 10 times EBITDA. 10 times EBITDA may include some uh, uh, burnouts, but uh, Smith & Wesson is a very, uh, very active acquirer on the accessory side, and they have been known to pay uh, almost 10 times for groups. Uh, as we move into the sale process, you know, the most important uh, piece when you're dealing with a sell side process, whether it's selling 100% of your business or 30 or 40% of your business, is a memorandum. When the memorandum details everything about your company, from the management team to the products to the sales channel that your product rolls through, to the historical financials, to projected financials, all the intellectual property slash legal items that munitions group can help you out with. And then that memorandum is the cornerstone of, of helping us to run our auction. And many times, you know, people in life hate to pay fees. Well, the good news is that the banker really pays for themselves because we can have the tough, hard-nosed conversations with the private equity folks or the buyers that you as a sell side group don't necessarily want to have because you, we just have the tough conversations and we drive value. And as we run the sale process, we whittle, we whittle the, uh, the, the group of folks down to a handful of, 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 of interested buyers, get rid of the tire kickers, and we garner, we like to garner anywhere from a handful to up to a half dozen term sheets for folks to choose the right home for their brand. And then we help the buyer through the closing and, and due diligence process. And it takes, it takes time, it takes a significant amount of effort, it takes dispassionate and balanced advice, and there are ups and downs to the sale process. But when you have a trusted financial advisor who, like the, our Hickory professionals, we've been at this for over two decades now as a firm. And we've seen the ups, we've seen the downs, and we can provide our, our client the sort of balanced advice that folks in this industry need, again, given all the implications of, 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 of what this industry entails. So that's the process. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's lengthy, but uh, we'd be happy to talk with folks uh, post-webinar about how we can help them. So we'll go through this each step now, kind of going back and forth more between Cliff and uh, Cliff Clay and Nick uh, on the legal side and the advisory side of how this works. Uh, Clay's going to start with the legal side. Let's talk about legal discussion on step one. Yeah, and, and I, you know, everybody can read these, but I'll, I'll sort of try to paraphrase what these are. So, you know, the first step is, is are you personally prepared to exit? And, and, and what I mean, what we mean by that on the legal side is, is are you ready 
uh, financially for this event. And, you know, again, we'll talk about that more in a minute. And then the second, you know, component is how do you execute a decision to exit? And, and really what that means is, is who can make the decision and how is it made? Uh, the third is the importance of, of conducting thorough internal due diligence. This is where you look at your own business. And, and it covers some of what Growth Strategy Partners does. And then the, the final stage is, is once you've got a willing seller and a willing buyer, what steps do you have to go through to get money in your hand? And Chris, I guess we can move. Yeah, the next slide. <clears throat> you know, are you personally prepared for, for an exit? And the, the, the main components of this are what, what you're trying to do is are you set up personally to, to take this financial event and um, minimize your taxes, um, try to protect your assets from, from creditors? It could be the government from a tax standpoint. It could be from third parties. You know, even if you don't expect to have a creditor problem, we think it's wise for clients who are selling a business to have uh, structures in place that will protect those assets anyway. You know, you think about your worst case scenario and you say, are we prepared for it so that my family benefits from my hard work? And then the you, next uh, slide. Yeah, hey, ahead, but even, just, uh, as, a, as a topic here, it's interesting, uh, knowing that people are, you know, three to five years out. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got a, a client. Uh, that has some some daughters. He's going to sell the business 100%. The daughters are not going to work in the business. They're not going to be involved. They're just doing their own thing. But from a planning perspective, tax planning perspective, uh, we were talking to him about: Do you want to? Uh, you're going to. You're going to. He's going to make you know 20 million dollars on this thing. So he's going to plenty of plenty of money to live for whatever years he wants to do it. And but the question was: are You do you want to give some of this to your kids now? Right. So from an estate planning perspective, the value of the business is lower it is today than it is when it's going to be sold. And so we actually talked to him about that. And he goes, yeah, I'll, I'm going to give X percent to my kids. And so they, he started doing that now from an estate planning <laughs> perspective. And, you know, he had all the trust and stuff set up anyways. But, you know, looking a couple of years out, you know, you can do that now. You can't do that, you know, necessarily the year of necessarily and get that tax benefit you know, that your, your kids and or you will get, right? Exactly. It's kind of like winning the lottery. I mean, you, you know, you, you read it. I've never won it. Uh, I don't really play it, but you get your lump sum payment, right? And, and you, maybe you get 60% of that. Right. Well, you know, how, how can you set this up so maybe you get 80% of it? Okay. And that's really what we're talking about. We won't go down that path. Okay. <laughs> I'll, move, I'll move on. Go ahead. So, so the next slide is is really, and this is this is one where I've seen problems arise where where someone uh, kind of has a, a more of a hurried decision to sell. And what we're talking about here is 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 from a practical standpoint, who has the ability to make the decision, and how is it made? And you know, the, the first bubble on this top left it says governance and partnership agreements, and that really applies if you've got a business partner. You've got someone else who owns the company who has input in the decision. You have to look at your governance agreements. It's an operating agreement or a shareholders agreement, and you have to say, what does it take for us to sell the company? Does it take unanimity? Does it take supermajority? Does it take something else? And so you really need to look at what your agreements say so you can understand who has to be involved in making that decision and then executing on it properly because there may be certain documents, notice documents or, or so forth that you have to, to produce to do this correctly so it doesn't get hung up by somebody who might oppose it. And then the second component of that down at the bottom, third party agreements, this is where, and a lot of times this is something where um, you don't realize it's there and it may be that you've got assets that are collateral to a lender. And, you know, your, your security agreement may say that you cannot assign or sell that asset without consent. And so, you know, you need to do sort of an inventory of any third party agreements you've got 
and figure out whether there are any restrictions contractually on your ability to decide to sell the company. And, and once you address those two components, then you can, you can exit. Hey, Clay, if somebody, just thinking here, because we talked about the first thing they need to do is put a team together. But even before, again, they're three or four years out, uh, unfortunately, I've talked to a lot of owners that have partners, might even be minority partners, but they don't have any governance agreements, buy, sells, or anything like that. Would that be the first thing they should do, like immediately at least start putting that together if they don't have that? Yeah. You know, so, so really, and what happens is, is if you don't have those documents, then, then you're going to be, it's going to be controlled by a state statute. So, you know, you may have a limited liability company act or a corporations act, and they're going to have default provisions in there that say, you know, here are the decisions that all shareholders or all members have to make. And it may say a decision to sell the company. So if you've got an operating agreement, or let's say you have 90% of the company, but you don't have an operating agreement. Well, if, if you're under the LLC Act, it may be that, that your 10% owner has to be on, on board. And so that can be a problem. So yeah, you, you, you want to look at where you are with all these components now to prepare for that. Good point. All right. So, so now that we've done a little prep work, um, let's talk about valuation. How do you how do you value a business? And Nick has all the answers. Go ahead, Nick. <laughs> Chris, I wish I had all the answers, or else we sell <laughs> every client. We sell every client for twenty times EBITDA. But uh, you know the, uh, the 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 fact in this sector is, you know, clients will typically sell from six times EBITDA to eight times EBITDA. That's just the fact of life. If you're an accessory firm, you'll find yourself on the uh, top end eight to 10 times. Uh, if you're a pure rifle firm slash handgun firm, you'll find yourself on the lower end. Um, many times we'll, we'll counsel clients that it's maybe better to take some money off the table, to recapitalize their business, to take on a partner, to take on debt or equity. The firearm market, Chris, is so unique. This is not an apparel firm. This is not a widget manufacturer. This is a company um, that has, as we have seen with the Las Vegas shooting, and as you know, Clay said, you know, our, our friends there at the munitions group say, and our friends there at growth strategy partners say, there's overnight risk to this business, and no one on this phone call should ever think otherwise. There is, from the buy side, from the folks that we talk to in the capital markets, their number one job is not to lose capital and not to put capital at risk. And your, your business may have been in your family for three generations, 50 years, 100 years. Folks who write the checks, folks who have the capital, don't care. They're, they care about making sound investments. And that may seem harsh, but I have to give folks give it to folks straight you have to understand the industry we're in and you have to understand that if i'm not going to get the price that i want then maybe i should think about a limited sale or recapitalizing my company because you know as, as clay pointed out there are tax issues there are personal estate planning issues and to have your personal large portion of your personal assets in your business that's that's difficult and folks should really think about if I can't sell for the price I want, do I recapitalize my business? Do I take some chips off the table? And there are ways to do that. And again, we'd be happy to discuss. But there's really four key metrics when you value a company. And there's the classic DCF, this kind of cash flow analysis, precedent transaction analysis, which is basically, you know, what did the house down the street sell for? What did the company down the street sell for? There's a multiples method where you look at trading multiples and you take a discount because you're a private company and a further discount because you're in the firearm sector. And then there's a classic LBO analysis, which is if I took on a bunch of debt, capitalized my business, and I aim to get someone at, someone at a private equity rate of return of 25 or 30 percent, what would that number have to be? So, you know, these are, are all guideposts that any financial executive has access to, any financial executive can run. But again, we're dealing with the firearm market sector. And that's why on this call, um, it really behooves folks to understand and think through the process, um, understanding this unique industry that we're all in. Okay. And I, again, keep the, keep the point that that um, 
we've been inferring a full sale, but partial sale is actually quite common and actually very helpful for the uh, for the for the owners. Um, yep, and, and, and it allows you. I'm sorry. Yep. And it allows you the, and, and Clay to add further value to a company. It it allows folks the opportunity to take on capital to grow their business. It allows you, Chris the folks at Growth Strategy Partners, the opportunity to work your magic to help someone grow revenue and allows Clay the opportunity to, to get into a company and, and, and get the books in order, to get the legal documents in order. That's why sometimes folks prefer a two-stage sale process. Right, right. Um, and, and again, just a, an observation is that usually when we're having conversations with the owner and I ask them what do they think it's worth, it's usually a lot higher than it, than what it really is. I assume Nick, you see the same thing, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So we're in the process of selling. Um, so let's go and look at the next uh, step is after you've got the valuation done, uh, the next three need, you know, put the memorandum together, the sale auction and the term sheet. Nick, why don't you explain how this works and how it works well? Yep. How, how it works well is really a partnership, Chris and, and Clay, as you guys at Growth Strategy Partners and Munitions Group partner with your clients. We really have to partner with, with our client in, in the sales side process. We need one person who is a point person, the traffic cop, to manage the flow of information, right? We, we cannot, you know, we can help set the strategic narrative but we can't make up information. We can't make up forecasts. That has to come from the client. So throughout the, throughout the, throughout the process of developing the materials, maintaining a due diligence center, um, you know, working with our contacts on the, on the other side of the table in the capital markets, you know, managing the due diligence process and closing process, the, the, the most efficient way to, 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 to manage, um, to, to manage a sale process is to have close partnership with the client. And I know that sounds hokey, but again, just giving it to the folks straight here on the webinar, you need to invest, you know, and, and I'll allocate us one resource, whether it's your chief of staff, your personal assistant, or your COO, really makes the process go quick. Great. Great. And this, this is a lot of, a lot of time, you know, this is why, again, we talk about preparing in advance. Uh, having gone through one just recently with a client, you know, they didn't have the reporting that they that they should have had, and it took us a while just to get basic reporting done, sliced by product, by by customer, by category, by brand, um, and just some of that basic reporting wasn't there. We we developed it in advance, and so that when the buyer came down and asked for all these reports, we just printed them right out, and buyers were wow, look at that. So there's a lot of work, especially when you get into the transaction itself. But let's hold on to that thought and let um, Clay talk about, on the legal side, some of the things to worry about. Yeah, and so, so we're looking at the, the stages of the transaction. This is the, you know, what are the steps we have to do to actually get money in your hand? And, um, you know, the first one, obviously, is you, you, so you're shopping around and you're trying to find a willing buyer and a willing seller. And uh, once you've got that and you've got a, sort of a, a, a conceptual deal, you put it in a term sheet. Um, and, and in that term sheet, you're going you're gonna to address the basic terms. Is it, a, is it an equity sale? Is it an asset sale? Is it something else? What's the price going to be? How's that going to be paid? And when are you going to do this? When are you going to close it? And then the second stage is, is the transaction checklist. And what you're doing here, really, at the end of the day, is you're diagramming out, designing out the transaction. And this is a really important stage because if you don't do this, then you can miss something. Uh, you can miss the timing, for example, if you have to get your own federal firearms license, if you're, or if the, the buyer has to get its own federal firearms license and that step is not appreciated early enough in the process, it can slow things down. And then the third stage is, is, is transaction due diligence. And this really, you know, I mentioned earlier um, this concept of internal due diligence, and that's part of what I'm talking about here. The internal due diligence really happens before stage one. And that's where you are, and I, I like to sort of dumb things, dumb's the wrong word, but I like to simplify things, having tried a bunch of jury cases when I was younger. Um, 
I like to use a real estate analogy because I think most people can understand that if you buy a home and you live in it for a decade, you have to take care of it. You have to maintain it. You have to repair it. You have to clean it. You have to, to maintain it. And you have to do the same thing with your business. And, you know, internal due diligence is where you inspect what you're doing and you, and you make sure that it, that, that you identify problem areas that you can address before you even talk about selling it. And, um, you know, the, the biggest issue I've seen with due diligence has been, and this was something, and this is a good story to tell because it's something that could have been dealt with during the seller's internal due diligence, but it was uncovered during the buyer's due diligence. And this is what it was. We had a, a, a stock purchase deal. And I represented the buyer and a stock purchase was going to involve the whole company and the buyer uncovered um, adverse ATF administrative action history. You know, there had been some, they, the, the seller had been called into ATF on some pretty major violations in the past. And it really meant that that license uh, had some, some scratches on it. It also meant there may be an issue with, with what they're doing procedurally from a compliance standpoint during operations. So what had to happen, we had, they had to, we had to redesign the entire deal. It ended up closing at a lower price and it cost a lot of people jobs. You know, the seller in this instance wanted a lot of their longtime employees to stay on board. And that was, that was, an, that was a term, but the due diligence showed that those people um, couldn't be trusted with the compliance side of things and, and they couldn't stay. So, you know, you want to do due diligence before you even sell your company. You want to look at what you're doing. You want to look at your maintenance. Are you using, you know, updated, modern, state-of-the-art technology? Um, does everything look good, right? And, and then that's going to happen. The buyer is going to do the same thing. The buyer is going to do an inspection of your operations during its due diligence and if, if something goes wrong or something is uncovered that's not a positive, then it can, it can affect the price. It could even you know, cause the deal not to close. And then the, the fourth stage, once you and, – and this really oftentimes happens during due diligence as you start drafting the purchase agreement. And, and this is really a lawyer thing. There's a lot of back and forth. There are a lot of drafts. But you deal with the details, the legal, financial, the representations and warranties – all that lawyer stuff that's in the purchase agreements. Great, great. Um, Nick, now we're we're at the point where we're closing. What happens? You want to make sure? Yeah, I'm okay, here, I, sir. I, you know, I, I tell you this: you want to make sure that during this entire process, you keep your eye on the ball and you keep your eye on the operations of the company. Because as much as we've talked about, um, you know, preparing the company for sale, it's imperative upon the business owner that he keeps his executives and his and his frontline employees running the business properly and smoothly. Because I have personally seen situations where if there's a month or a quarter dip, that might give buyer cold feet or a desire to perhaps. Uh, move the multiple around a little bit. And so you want to make sure during the closing, obviously Clay and the munitions group, they handle all the checklists and make sure that they wrestle appropriately, appropriately with the lawyers on the other side of the table. But you also want to make sure that you run the business as if you're going to be operating it for the next 100 years. Because you want to give the buyer or the investor zero room to open up negotiations. Good point. And if they don't, if they want to take their eye off the ball or, or the sites um, and they don't run yep. the business, that'll impact them negatively at, at closing, right? Yep. And, and one thing, Chris, and I know that we've got about 10 minutes left here. There's a whole human capital issue here that we could literally spend a good 10 or 15 minutes discussing. How do you socialize the sale process with your executives? and with the folks in the firm who need to know. Because during the closing and diligence process, we as bankers and, and, and perhaps lawyers, you'll be having meetings at the client site. 
obviously we're not going to show up in a suit and tie we'll dress appropriately you don't want folks in the factory or folks in the field that think you know anything important is happening you don't want folks to get skittish so there's a whole human capital side to managing you know who needs to know the sale process and and how you want to handle that internally so that's another thing that they should follow up with you at growth strategy partners and in, in handling the human capital side of the process and the folks at, at munitions group you know how do you handle do you have options uh in the sale process you have to you have to pay out do you have phantom options do you have folks you want to give a bonus to for their years of service and dedication to the company so human capital is a very important part of this very good point very good point what about legal nick or clay yeah, and, and we'll run through these pretty fast. I mean, obviously, the closing is you sit down at a table, or maybe not. You know, it could be remote nowadays, and you sign documents. Money gets wired. Um, obviously, you want to get to the closing table as soon as you can. And then the, the last stage is, is the seller's post-closing obligations. Now, just a couple of things I'll hit on on this that really the two most important ones are the reps and warranties, and, and what that what, what those are, you're going to make in the purchase agreement, in the sale agreement, you're going to make statements that the buyer relies on. And um, they, the truth of those statements may not be um, fully revealed prior to closing. They survive the closing. So if in the future any of those representations and warranties prove false, it can cause problems for the seller down the road. Can cost them money. Uh, they may have other obligations they weren't expecting. So, so those are things to really think about and be aware of as you're as you're you know getting close to a, as you're negotiating the agreements. And then the second thing is restrictive covenants. And these these things, I tell you what, they they are uh, they're a mixed bag. You know, they're they're great if you're uh, an employer. They can be difficult if you're an employee or a seller. You know what they mean. You know what these things do. There may be a provision in your sale agreement that restricts your ability to compete directly or indirectly with the company you sold. And you know you need to be aware of that. You need to understand how that works. You need to be very careful about it. You, and I know this is the legal side, but stage seven is party, I believe. Is that right? Where, what slide are we looking at? I'm just teasing you. Oh, um, party? No. Yes. Yeah, party. Yes. Party. Celebrate. Yes. At yeah. your okay. at your house. At my Chris house. DeSenza. Welcome. Always, always, always. Um, Nick put a good a good slide here, just talking about how to make the process. We talked earlier about this being a sale process, and some of the key points here. So maybe Nick, you want to just hit upon some of those? Sure. Absolutely. You know, to use a successful sale process, um, number one, you have to understand the industry. And as I said, you know, in this industry, uh, multiples of sale prices can be depressed. You have to find the right advisor who understands the market, who understands the right buyers. You have to understand the uh, the, the needs of the client. Is it a 100% sale? Is it a sale that's dictated by events? Or does that client have time? If the client has time on their hands, I would suggest looking at a stage sale process so that we can take advantage of you know, taking some capital off the table, getting the client situated for a second bite at the apple. And then finally, the advisor should always be thinking about the ABCs, always be communicating. You always have to be communicating with the client and with your capital targets. You always need to be contacting. Relentless focus on growing a list of potential capital contacts. No, no deal is set in stone until you sign that term sheet that has exclusivity. So you sign that, that term sheet with exclusivity, you're always contacting the market. And ABC, always be closing. Focus on a relentless process that drives towards a successful conclusion for the client. You always have to think about closing. It's very Glen Gary, Glen Ross, but it's always the ABCs, always be closing. <laughs> always be closing. Uh, yeah. Funny. Um, we got a few minutes. So we're, we've got questions that we may have to get answered uh, right after this, uh, but if you have a few more and you want us to get to, we can follow up with you by email or something uh, or phone after. But I want to talk about the challenges uh, because this is some of the issues that owners run into, we've seen owners run into uh, when they start the sale process. So for those that don't look out a year or two or three and they go, oh, great, it's time to sell, 
and they've been expecting their value to be X, and then you know Nick comes in and does evaluation and goes, well, it's X minus. There's always that that surprise um, that well, geez, it's it's not what I expected. Uh, there's there's some surprises where someone has to sell quickly. It might be health. It might be other reasons, uh, and they gotta they gotta get out. You know, and that's hard to 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 do a good job or get the value you want when it's done quickly. Um, we've talked to some some owners. Yeah, I've been talking to these guys. Good, I know some customers. I know some vendors. They they want to buy my company, so I don't I don't need to worry about a process. I don't need to worry about looking for buyers. I know a few. And when you start peeling that back, um, they're not maybe good investors. They may not have the money. You know, everybody's always talking a good game. Yeah, 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 I'll, I'll buy you. Heck, you know, I'm, I'm big. I got lots of money. I'll buy you guys. And it's really not the case. Um, there's the, oh, shoot. Uh, something came up that I didn't know about. Uh, this might fall into clay on the legal side uh, or environmental situations. So we're working with a client and they were going through the sale of the business. And unbeknownst to him, he owns the pond across the street, which was a public walkway that actually had some environmental issues. Uh, didn't know it until they went through in some details. Uh, we have talked a lot about uh, a partial sale. And partial sales are good when the owner stays in and continues to grow it. But uh, oftentimes there may be a sale and the owner says he's going to go work for the, for the new company. We were working with a client and the owner you know, was in his 60s and he said, this is great, I'm going to sell my business. I'm going to get a three-year contract. I'll go work for the new guys, and then I'll retire. Uh, I don't know what the, the, the math is. Maybe, Nick, you might know, but there's a very low percentage of success when uh, an independent owner, entrepreneur, has been running his own business or her business for years and now is now working for somebody else. Uh, well, Nick, do you know if there's any numbers? Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I, I can tell you, you know, we made our bones as a firm, you know, making Sam Edelman from $7 million of revenue up to 82 million in three years in the West consumer market. Now, granted, that was apparel. It was a very challenging consumer environment. Um, we've got another process. You know, our friends at Grunt Style took on some junior capital, and they're going to, you know, absolutely going to crush it. Grunt Style has been crushing it. We expect them to do great things. So, you know, just bookends of, of people doing well on the, you know, um, taking in capital. But it, but it's the mindset. Do you have the mindset yeah. of the, as the CEO to say, you know what? I'm going to partner with some really great people. You want to have partners in this world. You want people who are concerned about your success. So let's go uh, two minutes left. We're going to go through a couple more slides. Legal challenges you're going to have, industry timing. We could talk for an hour on industry timing alone. Uh, it may not work to your advantage. Um, but I want to do a poll because I am curious, one more poll, to see what people listening, what, what's your challenge going to be? What's your biggest challenge going to be in trying to sell your business. Uh, and if you click on an answer here, uh, is it is it creating the value that you're looking for in that business to match what you're looking for retirement? Um, is, it, is, it, is it a personal side with that circle earlier, personally making the transition? Uh, what about building your team? So a buyer won't buy the business if you're the key person and you're gonna be leaving. Okay, so therefore you might need a team for that. Finding the right buyer, right meaning not just it's all about money, but they're not going to move it, shut it down, uh, or or knowing what to do, you know, and and when to prepare my business. So curious here on what your top challenge is going to be, and I'm going to close this off real quickly and then wrap this thing up. Um, in fact, I'll um, probably because I'm seeing the scores right now, guys. So I'm going to do a quick uh, uh, close on this and then wrap this thing up, so we say pretty close to time. Uh, again, this you'll see this on the recording. But what you'll see, if assume everyone's seeing it now, is finding the right buyer is the number one challenge and putting a team in place, kind of the top two. Uh, great to see that the value is not a big number because usually an issue and knowing what to do. So let me uh, close that and, and do a, a wrap up here because the question is this. Some of the key points to take away today Always be prepared, always be preparing to sell. Um, timing, it may not be on your side. So again, that gets back to always being prepared. Start now and, and hire some experts, whether it's us or, or others in the industry. Uh, it is a little unique and 
um, you need to start preparing. This isn't something simple that you can actually do. You'll find more value and you'll get more value and you'll get more money if you hire some experts. So here's kind of a, you know, maybe the next step for you is to put an assessment together to figure out how prepared you are, okay, and to sell that business. If you have, so there was a bunch of questions. Uh, because of time, we're not going to be able to get to them, so I apologize for that. We'll try to answer them through email. If you need to reach us, uh, either of us, all of our or all of us, there's our contact information. Please give us a call. Uh, we will also be at a NASGW in a few weeks, and if you want to schedule a one-hour consultation with us to talk specifically about this, give us a ring or a call, and we'll schedule something for you. So I gotta I gotta say goodbye to everybody, Nick. Uh, Clay, thanks very much, NASUW. Thank you very much. Um, everyone have a great day. This will be recorded, and we will get this out to you shortly. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.